Let's open our Bibles to the fifth chapter of the book of Luke. I want you to pay careful attention to the 17th through the 26th verses, particularly that 17th verse. Luke 5, 17 says, And it came to pass on a certain day, as he was teaching, that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. And behold, men brought in a bed a man which was taken with a palsy, and they sought means to bring him in and to lay him before him. And when they could not find by what way they might bring him in because of the multitude, they went upon the housetop and let him down through the tiling with his couch into the midst before Jesus. When he saw their faith, he said unto him, Man, thy sins are forgiven thee. The scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this which speaketh blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he, answering, said unto them, What reason ye in your hearts? Whether it is easier to say, Thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, Rise up and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sins, he said unto the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, and took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God, and were filled with fear, saying, We have seen strange things today. I want you to notice the line, the last line of the 17th verse. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Now why was the power present? Well, it's obvious from throughout this entire teaching that Jesus gave there. And obvious from what the, what the Holy Spirit relays to us in the 17th verse, that the power was present to do two things. It was present to heal, and it was present to forgive sin. Now, was the power just there to heal the man with the palsy? No, it said that the power was there to heal the Pharisees and the doctors of the law which were sitting by because it said the power was there to heal them before the guy with the palsy ever showed up at the meeting. Isn't that right? It said the power of the Lord was there to heal them and the palsy guy wasn't even there. He hadn't gotten in there yet. Now, I want you to notice something else. There was not just one or two Pharisees in there. That's all that was there. Now, any of you that have read your New Testament <laughs> any length of time at all, know Jesus' attitude toward the Pharisees and the doctors of law. Hmm? But yet the power of God was there to heal them. The power of God was there to heal him. Now notice this. It came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea. That means every town of Judea and of Jerusalem. Well now we know that there's ten cities around Jerusalem at that time called the Decapolis. So that's the reason that the place was full. It was full of Pharisees and full of doctors of the law sitting by. And Jesus was in there teaching those men. 
And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Why was the power present to heal them? Was it just because Jesus was in there? No, the power was present to heal them because He was teaching the Word. And anywhere the Word is, the power of God is. For the Gospel is the power of God. Hallelujah. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. You might as well say amen. (laughs) Because that's the truth. Praise the Lord. Now, the power was there, like I said before, before the man with the palsy was ever brought in there. So it's obvious that the power of God was present to heal them. It was God's will that every single person sitting by Jesus be made well. And only one man got it. Only one. Why did only one receive? Now we have, a, we have an honest right to ask that question. We can ask that of Jesus. If the power was there to heal them all, then why did only one get it? I want to know, don't you? Praise God, I want to know. If the power was there to heal them, then the power is here to heal me. Jesus is here. And His Word is here. And the Holy Spirit is here. So the only difference would be The only thing left that would be any difference would be that you would have to be a Pharisee or a doctor of law. And we know that that couldn't be valid because the only guy that got it wasn't a Pharisee nor a doctor of the law. So that's no requirement. That doesn't have anything to do with it. Well, then, thank God that leaves the same situation then. We have the same ingredients here tonight. The same ingredients are here tonight. Jesus is here, the Spirit of God is here, and the Word is here and being taught. So... I want to know how come that guy got it and those others didn't. Because I'm choosing sides right now. I'm choosing up with the guy that got it, not the guy that didn't. And you see, folks, let me tell you something. The only reason that this incident was put in here is so that you and I can act like the man with the palsy acted and get healed. That's the only reason that scripture is in there. Nobody can keep the palsy acting like that fellow acted. There is no failure in God. Well, I know a man that didn't get healed. Well, then you know a man that didn't act like that man acted. Oh, yes, he did. No, he didn't. There is no failure in God. And that's the reason that scripture was put in there. He sent His Word to heal us. Thank God. And when we finally come to the viewpoint and understanding, it's not God holding out on us. It's our ignorance that's holding out on us. Our lack of knowledge of His Word is causing us to perish and die young. Glory to God, there's no failure in God. Say that. There is no failure in God. Hallelujah. Now, was it God's will that they be healed? Well, yes, most assuredly. I mean, there's no no question about that. It says the power of God was there to heal them. It was there to do it. It wasn't there that they might. It was there to do the job. That's the only reason that power came. God's power to heal them didn't come to prove that Jesus was the Son of God. If it did, he almost missed it. And if that's the reason the power of God did come, then he did miss it over at Nazareth because there he could do no mighty works because of their unbelief. Isn't that right? That's not the reason he healed anybody. You want me to tell you why Jesus healed people? You want me to tell you why he did it? Because he loved them. The Bible said he's moved with compassion and he healed their sick. Wasn't to prove anything. God doesn't have to prove anything. I don't know whether you know that or not. He's not the one that goofed. He doesn't have to prove he's God. He doesn't have to prove anything to you. Now, he will, but he doesn't have to. He said, prove me in this. The only thing he ever said that in was over in the financial realm. And that's the only realm we backed off and said, no, no, we wouldn't want to do that. You know? <laughs> that's the only place he ever said, prove me. Or in other words, put me to the test and I'll prove to you that this is so. That's the only thing he ever said, do that on. 
And so we tried to make him prove himself on everything else but that. Well, <clears throat> it was assuredly God's heal will that they be healed. Now, was it God's will that all those old dirty Pharisees and all them old dumb doctors not be healed because of the dirty way and the dumb way they are doing? No, it couldn't have not been God's will to heal them any more than it could have been God's will not to forgive them. Did you get that? Because that power was there to forgive sin just same as it was to heal the sick. Huh? See? It is there to forgive them. Well, you know good and well that God would forgive them. Well, if he'd forgive, he'd use that power to forgive their sin. He'd use that power to heal them. See? And we've had the idea, really, and you know, in the body of Christ, a lot of times we've had God, the idea that God was willing to forgive, but not willing to heal. Well, up to a point, there's a lot of people that believe that he's kind of just slipped on both. In fact, one fellow said, you know, he said, I'd been better off if I'd have killed my wife instead of divorcing her. He said, won't none of them forgive me for it. God did, won't none of the Christians forgive him for it. Won't even let him come to church. Well, I'm going to tell you something. You're not such a hot rod yourself. Do you know that? I mean, man, listen, you know, where in the Bible did it ever say that adultery was the, the unpardonable sin? You can't find it. Yeah, but Jesus said... Well, now, you wait a minute before you shoot your mouth off about what Jesus said. You better know something about what Jesus said before you go to... about what Jesus said. Yeah, but he said if a man married somebody to be divorced, he's living in adultery. Yeah, but that wasn't but for a year. Huh? I never heard anything like that before. That's what you should have shut up for. For you and said that. The sacrifices were being offered. All you had to do was go to the temple and, and ask forgiveness. And, and when, the, when the atonement was made at the close of the year, you could receive atonement for that sin. Well, what the heck come he didn't say that? Well, he thought you'd have sense enough to read. <laughs> Are you listening to me? Huh? Brother, the way you're preaching will just invite people to be divorced. Look, they're not having to have an invitation. I'm going to say something to you right now. I don't ever want you to forget it. Now listen to me. No born again child of God is hunting a way to sin. They're hunting a way out of it. No born again child of God wants a divorce. Many a child of God's been deceived, duped, tricked, and all different kinds of of divisive things by Satan have caused other Christians to slip. And I'm, I'm sorry to say there have been divorces among Christian people, but don't knock them in the head for it. Dear God, pray for them and minister to them. You know why? Because there's forgiveness in the blood of the Lamb. There's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. Now then. We know that it was God's will to forgive and God's will to heal. How do we know that? Well, we know from this word that says right there that it was, but now wait a minute. We have another way that we know. I want to go dig into this area about why these other men didn't receive. And when, before I get into this, now I want, to, I want to show you something that happened here. Jesus got into some dialogue with these men while that man with the palsy was still laying there sick on that, on that couch he brought in, or that pallet they brought in there on, brought him in on. Isn't that right? He's, there's some things going back and forth. There's a dialogue going back and forth between them and, and Jesus. 
Jesus is doing most of the talking. What they were doing, they were is in their heart, but he perceived it and brought it out into the open. Now I want you to notice something here before we get into this. I want you to see something. Jesus told the man, get up and get out of here. Now you just look at it. That you may know that the Son of Man hath power upon earth to forgive sin. He said to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, Arise, take up thy couch, and go into thine house. And immediately he rose up before them, took up that whereon he lay, and departed to his own house. Jesus told him to get up and get out of here. Why? There's something going on here that caused people not to receive from God. And here is a man that was receiving. Here is a man that his faith was alive. The Bible says it was. Jesus saw their faith. He's not talking about just the faith of the men that knocked a hole in the roof. Listen, brother, you got to have some faith working to let men drag you up on the roof and you sick of the palsy. <laughs> now, you just don't think about that a little bit. Well, that that fellow wasn't any less proud of his roof than you are yours. What would you feel like when you're out there in the front, you know, and the finest donkeys in the land parked out there? And all the head guys are in there. Everybody you know is in there. Everybody you're afraid of is in there. And they carried you down there in a sack, brother. And got you out front. And they couldn't get in there. And they go to dragging you up on the roof. Now, you know what you would say? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, put me down! (laughs) Now, I let y'all drag me down here in the first place. I'm not going in there and tear up this fellow's roof. And in the second place, I'm sick enough as it is, man. Now, you're not going to drag me up and drop me off this roof and me roll all the way down there on the street. Now, I've had hard enough time and it's hurt my bones bad enough for you to drag me down here in this rag. You, You just take me home. Must not be God's will for me to get it. I can't get in there anyway. The door is shut. If it is God, the door would be open. How many times you heard that old dog? Well, that old dog still won't hunt, and you might as well forget it. Now, I'm going to prove it to you in a second that it won't work. He told him, man, he said, get out of here, boy. Get up and go home. Well, he did. Why? What was going on in that atmosphere that choked off the Word of God? Jesus gives us the answer to it when he said in verse 22, What reason ye in your hearts... Now, he didn't say, what reason ye in your mind. He said, what reason ye in your heart. And, brother, that's a different thing than reasoning in your mind. You can't tell a man not to reason with his mind because God gave him his mind to reason with. In fact, the Word of God says, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. I saw that on a signboard one time out in front of a town I was driving into. And and it, it was put up there by a particular church of a denomination that's famous for believing nothing. And and it had the scripture reference, you know, on, on the bottom. It said, said, come let us reason together. And it had the scripture reference in Isaiah, you know, down on the bottom. Of it. And I read that and I drove on along there and, I, and it, it got to irritating my spirit. And I thought, there's something wrong there. And it got to bothering me so bad that I finally just pulled over the side of the road. I couldn't stand any longer. I, 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 could, I didn't know what was the matter with it. You know, I just knew the spirit of God was was displeased with that and grieved with it. And, and I, I couldn't figure out why since it was Scripture. But you know, there's not anything in the world any more devastating than half a Scripture. I couldn't stand it. I finally pulled over and got my Bible open and said, Come, let us reason together. Now that's all they had on there, see, on that big old sign. Come, let us reason together, blah, 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 church. But the Scripture said, Come, let us reason together, saith the Lord. They were getting together reasoning with one another. He said, Come, reason with me. There's all the difference in the world, man, in reasoning with one another and reasoning with God. If you lean to your own understanding among one another, I can promise you disaster. 
It can't go any other way but disastrous. Because the human mind is in enmity against the law of God. And it cannot be in line with the law of God. That's the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. You, the mind does not produce that law. It's produced out of the heart. That's where the power comes from, is out of the heart, not out of the mind. Now, your mind will follow along when your spirit decides that the Word is true. But your Word is in enmity against the law, against the power of God, because there's no power in your mind. The power is in your spirit, in your heart. Now, Jesus said, What reason ye in your heart? You remember that Jesus said, If a man lusts after a woman in his heart, he has already committed it. Did you notice there? He said, in your heart. He didn't say anything about your mind. The Bible said, bring every thought into captivity in Jesus. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus. Now what it said? Well, you wouldn't have anything to cast down if your mind never did have that kind of thought. He's talking about the mind. That's the reason our, our president, bless his heart, got in trouble in that Playboy magazine interview because he did not know the difference between the mind and the heart. And when those ungodly people get through with you, brother, you better know the difference. They'll wind you up like a clock and turn you loose, you know. That's just the way it is. If you don't know the Word of God, it'll come out. If you don't know spiritual law as well as the words in the Bible... Then you cast your pearl before the swine, they'll rear up and ring you with it, brother. Because it is foolishness to the world. And if you don't know the Word of God, they'll make a fool out of you. Christians, really, particular ministers of the gospel, ministers, even double particularly, that are involved in a, a prophetic ministry, don't have any business getting on television being interviewed by worldly people. You don't have any business doing that. That's not your calling to do that. Oh, but we need that exposure. That's what you get is exposed. <laughs> God will do all the exposing you need. All you need to do is just relax and preach the Word. I'm not going on there without God specifically speaks to me and tells me to go on there and do that. And he's already told me not to get on there and, and be interviewed by some unborn again, ungodly man or woman, and so I'm not going to do it. I'm just not going to go. Well, wouldn't you like to have that publicity? No. I'm not looking for publicity. Wouldn't Jesus be glorified? No. No. Mm -mm. What glorifies God? Faith. The Word of God glorifies God. You get on there like that, you get out of line with where you, what you're called to minister in, and I'll tell you right now, the anointing will leave you like a bird off your shoulder. And you're sitting there arguing with that fellow trying to prove a point. And you may prove your point and turn out looking like an idiot. Are you listening to me? This is what was going on, you see, in the hearts of those men. Now listen to me. The reason Jesus said, if a man looks after a woman who lusts after her in his heart, he's already done it. If he has that thought in his mind, just simply means Satan is trying to move him. He's trying, he's tempted. That's just simply a temptation. That man stopped and said, no, I take authority over that thought in the name of Jesus. I refuse to walk in there. Father, I just pray for that woman in the name of Jesus. I lift her up to you for your healing power and for your word to come on her. You can't pray about her and lust after her at the same time. <laughs> but now listen. The difference between having that thought in your mind and having that thought in your heart is described like this. I asked the Lord, and this is the way he described it to me. The difference is this. If you have toyed with that thought and played around with it until it has gone from your mind down into your spirit, the reason Jesus said you've already done it simply is because 
if it's in your heart, you'll do it if you get the chance. If murder is in your heart, you'll do it if you get the chance. Just to have the law deter you from murder does not mean you're not a murderer. Uh, just to refrain from killing somebody just on count of your life and get caught. Well, thank God, I mean, you got deterred some way or another. But where you're personally concerned in your relationship to God, you're a murderer. You listen to me? Not just because you had the thought and you just got mad and had that thought in your head. Cast that thing down in the name of Jesus. Don't let it get down into your spirit where you would do it if you could get away with it. Are you listening to me? Now, apply that to what Jesus said. Why reason ye? What reason ye in your heart? They were not reasoning in their mind. If they'd been reasoning in their mind, they would, the, the man would have sat here and thought, Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now, this man said something here I don't understand. He has said, Son, your sins be forgiven you. I thought only God had the power to forgive sin. But now, wait a minute. Now, well, I want to know, though, what the Word has to say about it. I just uh, wonder what the Bible says about that. In fact, I don't believe I'll make a judgment on that until I find out what the Word says about it. Now, I think the Word says only God can forgive sin. But now, I'm not sure. I don't know. I better reserve my opinion of this. And so I just set that thought, of, that thought aside. Now, he would have been thinking in his mind had he done that. He'd been reasoning in his mind. And since he didn't know, he wasn't going to just take it because us Pharisees believe that. You know, or because some other Pharisee said that. But he wants to know what God's Word said about it. He wants to know what God said about it. Now, you know what he's about to do? He's about to find out what God said about it. Because the man turned around there and proved what God would do about it because the man got up and walked out. Amen. All right. But reasoning in your heart says this. Whoa, wait a minute. That can't be so. Why? Because I'm already convinced in my heart that it's not so. And no matter what you say and no matter what the Bible said and no matter what you do is going to change what I think, what us Pharisees or us Baptists or us Methodists or us Assembly of God thinks about it. Amen. Are you listening to me? They were reasoning in their hearts. Not in the mind. In the heart. It was already that way. Not what God said about it, but what they thought He said about it was already settled in their heart and there was no changing it. No way of getting around it. It was that way. They were reasoning in their heart. They weren't reasoning with their mind trying to know the answer. They were reasoning in their heart because they said, We're right Bless God, no other can be right. Did you ever meet anybody like that? Amen. You've been that way yourself. Every single one of us has been that way at one time or another. Amen? Now, there are things in my heart that I am convinced about. But I'm convinced of them only from the basis of two or more witnesses out of the New Testament. And I'm talking about all of the Scripture involved with it, not just some little old dab here and there, you know, to make it say whatever I want it to say. You can make a doctrine of hanging. Judas hung himself, go down and do likewise. See? By taking two Scriptures and putting them together. That's right. You could, you could do that, but, and it, it'd be stupid, yes, but that's no more stupid than some of the other stuff we've come up with because some little old dab of Scripture said it. You can take the Bible and make it say anything you want it to say. Now, they were reasoning in their hearts, not with the Word. Not with the Word. I want you to know this also. God's Word says, of whom much is given, much is required. Hmm? These were men that had access to the written Word. What does the written Word have to say about that? Can you think right offhand what the Word would have to say that would apply to this situation? The man's sin was not forgiven him just because Jesus said it. Now listen, because I don't want you to miss this. 
Of course, it went into motion when Jesus said it. Obviously, the man believed what he said. But now, you, I, want you to, I want you to get a hold of this. Jesus was not talking as the Son of God. He's talking as a prophet under the Abrahamic covenant. He didn't say anything but what the Father had already said. He didn't do anything but what he saw the Father do it. Are you listening to me? Jesus didn't come up with anything original until he went to the cross. Everything was in the Word. Everything was in the Word. He's called the Word of God. The 103rd Psalm says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless His holy name, and forget not all His benefits, who forgiveth all thine iniquities and healeth all thy diseases. The man had been healed and forgiven all the time and he just now found out about it. These Pharisees and doctors of the law had all been healed and all been forgiven all this time and they didn't know it. Why did they not know it? Because they were not reasoning with the Word of God. They were reasoning with their own ideas and their own man-made religion. Did you get that? Jesus didn't bring up anything new. He just said, Son, your sins are forgiven you. Had been all the time. Yeah, had been all the time. But now see, the, the problem was, this poor guy didn't know it. Why? Because all these religious fellas never had told him. All those preachers in there never had bothered to say anything to the fellow about it. I guarantee you he washed his hands right. They saw to that. Now that's what Jesus was talking about. And he said, you load men up with your traditions and then you don't even help them carry them. And if you want to get God really bent out of shape where you're concerned, if you really want to get Him on your case, that's a good way to do it. Load some fellow up with so much don'ts. Don't do this and don't do that and knock him in the head every time he slips. And then don't help him. Don't. <laughs> you better brace yourself. Because God, if you really want to know something, in the days you and I are living in, God's had all that He's going to take. Had all that He's going to take. I want to sound a warning to you. Don't judge ministries. Don't sit in judgment over men that are standing up in the name of Jesus. I don't care how squarely what they're saying sounds. I heard a person the other evening. I'd heard all kinds of things said about them. I'd heard, and some of it I thought myself. Ignorant enough to think some of it myself. But I've learned a long time ago not to go spouting my mouth off about it. Just keep your mouth shut. But this particular person was being interviewed, and I heard the interview, and I heard their side of it. And you know, it is altogether different what that person was teaching coming out of, their, out of that person's mouth than it was when it came back out of all these other people's mouths and telling what they were telling, trying to say what they'd been teaching. And there wasn't anything wrong with it I could hear. And I've heard all kinds of stupid things that are said about that particular person. Dear person. Dear child of God. And here's people trying to reason out what that person's saying because it don't just quite match and their terminology doesn't quite match what you've been told. Huh? Don't do it. Don't sit in judgment over it. There are people attempting to sit in judgment right today over, over the ministry that I'm responsible for. And the ministry that Kenneth E. Hagin is responsible for. Now, I'm going to tell you what, brother. It's not going to pay you to badmouth Kenneth E. Hagin. It's not going to pay you to come against and criticize Oral Roberts. I, you want me to tell you when it will be all right for you to criticize Oral Roberts? After you've won 35 million people to Jesus. I'll talk to you then. Until then... I'm not interested in what you got to say. Unless you want to pray for him and hold him up and thank God for him and believe God with him. I'm, I'm interested in that. Yeah, but brother, just for the, he did this and he did that. Oh, who told you he did in hell? 
Just shut that stuff up. I'm going to tell you, in these last days, if you don't reason with God's Word instead of reasoning in your heart based on your traditions and based on your already what you think and what all us so-and-sos think and the way we've been taught. Yeah, but brother, you know, we've been taught. That's probably what's the matter with you. <laughs> instead of just operating in love and compassion, you're going to wind up in trouble. I'm talking about serious trouble. Several people that I know have criticized and called that faith bunch out of Tulsa a cult. And some of them are dead right today in an early grave because of it, and there's more than one of them got cancer. And they don't know that's why they did it. These are, these are people that think they're being honest before God. I mean, they love God, sweet Christian people. And everybody's praying and believing God, trying to get them healed, and can't understand why they don't get healed. Why? Because they're playing around over in this area of criticism, playing around over in there with another man's calling and another man's ministry. That man is not your servant, so don't judge him. If you can't talk in love, don't talk. Just keep your mouth shut. The reason the body of Christ, the main number one chief reason why there is anybody at all sick in the body of Christ is simply because the body of Christ is not walking in the commandment that was given us by Jesus. When Israel walked in the commandments, they had no reason to fear anybody, anywhere, anytime, for any reason. And if we will learn to walk in the commandment that God has given us, we also will have no fear. For our commandment is to walk in love. And the Bible said that love casteth out fear. Glory to God. Hallelujah. You walk in that love commandment, you don't have any reason to be afraid of sickness and disease. You have no Bible reason to be afraid of death. No Bible reason to be afraid of, of inflation or depression or whatever else it is. Don't make any difference. Glory to God. You just keep right on sailing, brother. Just keep right on going. But the whole body of Christ, by and large, have never walked in that commandment few individuals here and there have, but nobody, as far as the body of Christ is concerned, no generation as a whole has ever walked in that commandment. That don't mean just love me as long as I'm preaching what you think I ought to. That doesn't mean just love me as long as I'm white or as long as I'm black or pink or green or something. That don't mean just love me as long as I've got good clothes. That don't mean love me when I don't have good clothes. It means love me. Love me. He don't even say you got to like me. Love me. <laughs> I can love you if I don't like you too good. Like don't have nothing to do with it. But if you'll exercise the love of God, you'll get to where you like me. Some people don't like me because they figure I don't know how to talk. Well, when you come to West Texas, you'll know how that feels. Because <laughs> everybody out there knows how to talk. There's no question about that. You know, God speaks Texas talk. <laughs> to me. Why? Because I can understand. I, I, I know what the man said. <laughs> you know, I mean, he talking what I can understand. He talks to you where you can understand. That's the reason most of the time he has to talk in Elizabethan English because that's all you will want to hear him say. I'll have news for you. God doesn't speak ancient English. Unless he has to to get it over to you what he's saying. Then why when we're prophesying do we speak so much of the time in that old English? Because through the King James translation that's what you fed down into your spirit. That's what's in there. So that's the way it comes out. Praise God. That doesn't qualify or disqualify. Are you listening to what I'm saying to you here? All right. Demand must be made on power for it to flow. Now this is a law. I want to ask you something. Would it be any more valid... 
for a man to go away from a meeting. There was a prayer line or whatever. One person was healed. And you go away out of that line and say, Well, I just guess it wasn't God's will to heal me. I didn't get anything. Now, would that be any more valid to say that than it would be for a fellow over here to say, You know, I guess it just wasn't God's will for man to fly because none of us have ever flown. Now, people said that. Isn't that right? I mean, they were trying to fly. There's always somebody jumping off of the house. Did you ever hear Charles Capps tell about he and his brother trying to fly? That's the funniest thing I've heard in my life. They're little old bitty boys, you know. One of them about nine, the other about eleven. Out there on the farm in Arkansas, and they they got them two shoebox lids and <laughs> tied them to their arms. They was going to fly. And they climbed up on the barn, man. They're going to jump off, you know. And, and they got in an argument about who's going to go first. They didn't have but one set of wings, see. And he said, I want to go first. And his cousin told him, said, no. Or his brother told him, said, no, I'm going to go first because, you know, it's my idea and I'm older. I'm going to fly down there to our cousin's house and back and then you can go. And he said, you sure you know how to do this? He said, yeah, all you got to do is flop. He said, I've been watching them birds and all they got to do is flop. Well, all right, he said, hurry up, because I want to go. <laughs> and his brother climbed up there on the edge of that barn and jumped off. Boom, you know, and he was hit. He said, <laughs> why? <laughs> why didn't you flop? <laughs> he said, I didn't have time. <laughs> now, you and I both know that flopping didn't have nothing to do with it. But he thought the reason why he didn't fly is because he didn't flop. It, it just didn't work, see? He said, well, give me them wings. I can do it. So he put those shoebox lids on his arm now. Climbed up there on top of that barn. And that old barn had some old roofing nails, you know, that still that had come loose, you know, and sticking up all over the roof, that old barn. And he had on a new pair of overalls and the, the bottom, of, you know, you, you, back there then, you know, you bought overalls to last a long time. It didn't make no difference whether they fit or not. And so you, you I remember mine, but I used to drag the bottom out of them old overalls. That, man, you know, they're five, six inches, sometimes too long. You tried to keep them rolled up and finally just forget about it, just walk on them. And he said his overalls was two or three inches too long, and he got up there on the edge of that thing, you know, and jumped off and hung one of those. You know, now that you, you'd have to be stupid to think that. But we've been just as stupid and just as antiquated in our thinking when you get over there in the church house about spiritual things as we were a hundred years ago about flying. People come out and say, God wanted men to fly, he'd put wings on them. No, God wanted men to fly. Now, all the laws that governed it were here. You could have flown a 747 in 1879 just as good as in 1979. Why didn't you then? Because did nobody know how to build one. Nobody knew how to put it together. Nobody knew the laws that governed it. What happened? Men had to dig and dig and not be willing to say, Well, it just ain't God's will. I'm just not going to do it. That's what we've done spiritually. Rather than to dig in the Word of God. Where spiritual law is concerned. Spiritual law is the parent of all physical law. It's not a haphazard, goofy, hanky-panky world where things just kind of just happen out of the blue. No, no. That one man that got healed there after he left there, I mean, you know, somebody said, well, God just wanted to heal him, but all those others he didn't want it. No, the Bible said the power there to heal them all. God's always been that way. There's no respecter of persons with God. 
Uh-uh. God hates sickness, disease, sin, demons, and fear, and poverty, and shame, and all of the other diabolical disaster that came on this earth when man unified himself with the devil, an alien spirit and an outlaw God. And the, the spiritual laws that have always been in motion are still in motion because God is the God of the spirit world. And He was there and is there and will ever be there. And there's no shadow of change in Him. He's not about to change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. His healing power is here. But demand has to be made on that power. Now you think about it a minute. Demand has to be made properly on any form of power or it'll be wild and destructive. Electricity. I like to use electricity as an example because electricity in the natural world is so comparable to the anointing of God in the spirit world. I mean, they operate so close to the same. There's been times I knew good and well I shorted out God's power and I didn't have the faintest notion how I did it. But I knew it did. And some of those things I've learned, some of them I haven't, and some of them I don't know why they work, I just know what to do to cause it to work. You know? There's a lot of things I don't understand about electricity, but there's a few things I do understand that's very basic. Uh huh. I've learned about sticking the plug in the wall. And I've also learned don't go take your pocket knife and cut the cord in two while it's plugged in. <laughs> or um, talk about the lights going out. Your lights will go out before the ceiling light goes out. Why? Because you misused that power. You don't have to be a, an electronics engineer to know not to stick a paper clip in that wall socket. You don't have to have a degree in electronics to figure out how to make a hair dryer work. Amen. All you got to do is take that book that comes with it, written by the person that made it, and it says, plug, plug in. <laughs> My lightning fast mind can figure that out. Take the plug, stick it in the hole over there in the wall. Well, what would you think about some fellow that stuck the plug into his ear? He plugged it in, didn't he? You think, that poor mullet is not going to get anything out of that dryer. <laughs> the, you know, the idiot paid $20 for that dryer and he's standing there with the plug plugged in his ear. And you go up to him and say, hey, you know, fella, I hate to butt in on you, but uh, you're not going to get anything out of that dryer. What? I couldn't hear you. Well, take the plug out of your ear and let me talk to you a minute. What? I said, you're not going to get anything out of that dryer. Why not? You don't have it plugged in. Yeah, I do, see? It's not going to work. What? What'd you say? <laughs> you don't have it plugged in. Well, I know I did that, though, before you started talking. I had to take it out to hear what you said. Well, all the time you're thinking, boy, straight from the funny farm this guy is. He is, wonder where he came from. He had to have been raised on the backside of the moon to be that dumb in, in today's society. I mean, brother, anybody don't know better than that. How do you think God feels? He's standing up there in that prayer line and Jesus said, Lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. And so we go through a lot of other things and probably too. But his hands were laid hands on them. The hands were laid on them. They walked away and said, Well, I guess it's just right in God's will to heal me. Why? Well, I still got this. Uh, here. The Word said, by His stripes you were healed. I know it says that. I'm a Bible scholar. 
You believe the Bible? Yes, amen. I'm for gospel. Are you here? No. See? And by the word says you're here. I told you I know that. What are you? No. Do you believe the Bible? Yes. After all. How come you didn't get your healing? I just don't know, brother. <laughs> Is there any electricity here? No. How do you know? I plugged the dryer in, didn't get anything. That's the way my granddaddy did it. Did he get anything? No. He didn't get anything either. <laughs> but I'm going to do it like he did it. Well, now I'm, I'm exaggerating this to a degree so that you'll see what I'm talking about. I'm not doing this to be funny. But if we look at it from this exaggerated viewpoint, we'll begin to see that what we have been doing is equally exaggerated. It just has not looked like it. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you now? Lean not to your own understanding, but trust in the Lord with all your heart. If He said... Lay hands on the sick. The believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. You either don't have a believer or you don't have any hands or you don't have any sick. Yeah, but look. <laughs> I don't care what your side looks like. I don't care what's on you. I don't care how you feel about it. Jesus said it, and I believe it, and as far as I'm concerned, you're recovered. I'm not even going to have no more to do with you. I'm just going to just believe you're recovered. Now, when you agree with me, you'll recover. Are you hearing me? This is a basic spiritual law. Now, power that flows without demand made upon it is wild and destructive. That same electricity that will run that hair dryer and run it well if you plug it in the wall over there. That same electricity, if you go stick that hair dryer in a tub of water, and we send your saddle home. Because you're done. <laughs> you are through, boy. Why? Well, now, wait a minute, brother. I thought that power was to dry my hair. It was. That's what it was intended for. That's the reason it was being generated. It wasn't being generated and shipped to you to kill you, but by misusing it, you caused a flow that was not demanded nor called for. You didn't call for that power to flow like that. It was misused and it flowed wrongly. So what happened? It was wild and destructive. Water that's allowed to flow without any restriction can be wild and destructive. The power that was there to heal them that day. Now listen to me, I want you, you, you've got to get this now, because this will answer questions. You can chew on this for weeks, brother, and answer questions of why and why not all afternoon long. The power that was there to heal them that day is the most powerful element known. Not just known to man, but to God. Why? Because it was the power of God was present to heal them. The power of God. If there is any power that we are going to 
have to handle correctly, it's going to be the power of God, brother. If that power was released out here just to handle any way you want to, as stupid as we've been about spiritual law... And, you know, that's like taking my airplane out here and you start back to Fort Worth in it. And you're tooling along there 300 miles an hour. And call a six-year-old boy out of the cabin back there and say, Go ahead and fly this a while. I'm going back here and relax a little bit. You're going to do that? Not in my airplane, you're not. <laughs> No, you don't do that. You don't walk into some little 10-year-old boy and say, you know, here's a 30-06. Go out in the backyard and play, but be careful. It's loaded. Now, don't misunderstand. That 10-year-old boy can be taught to shoot as good as you can. When my boy was 10, he's as good a shot as me. I don't know but what now. He's probably a little better now. If he can see it, he can hit it. But you can't put a 42-year-old head on a 13-year-old boy. And it's foolish to try. It's not that he's a bad boy. He's a good boy. But there's been times when I've told him, I said, Now, John, you leave that gun sitting right where it is unless Daddy's there with you. You don't shoot that, that piece. You leave it right there. You understand that? Now, just leave it right where it is and eat it. Why? He's just as good a shot as I am. Well, I'll tell you why. One reason, just like he and I were out one day, we were bird hunting and we had our shotguns. We got shotguns just alike and we walked out there and there's a little old shed to the thing here that belonged to my wife's granddaddy. And a great big old spider. I mean a big one. Boy, that thing, great big thing, crawled down off the edge of that roof down on the corner post of this little shed that had been built out there. He crawled down on that corner post, and the first thing John wanted to do was shoot it. <laughs> Not thinking about the fact he's going to blow the barn away. <laughs> All he'd think about was the spider. And he threw down on that spider. I said, don't shoot that. He looked over at me like, what are you being ugly to me for? You know, he looked over at me there. I said, hey, man, the spider is on the post. <laughs> Let's let them two guys out there digging a hole one day. And one of them said, I wonder how come he gets paid so much more than we do. I mean, he don't, he don't ever do nothing. He just sits over there. One of them said, I don't know. I'm going to go ask him. So he climbed out of the hole, walked over there to the guy and said, How come I don't get to sit up here with you? He said, Intelligence. He said, Huh? He said, Intelligence. He said, You don't know what intelligence is? Uh-uh. He said, Come here and I'll show you. He said, Now, put his hand up against a tree. He said, now I want you to hit my hand as hard as you can. Oh, man, he said, yeah, he said, hit the hand right there. Hit it right in the center as hard as you can. The guy said, you want me to? I really want you to hit the hand. He dragged back and swung. And he just moved his hand. The guy hit that tree. I mean, you know, just caved his old hand in, man. He said, see what I told you? Intelligence. <laughs> He walked back over there at that hole, and that guy said, Did you find out? He said, Yeah, I found out. He said, What was it? He said, Intelligence. He said, What's that? He said, You mean you don't know? He said, That's right, I don't know what is intelligent. He said, I'll show you. Hit my hand. <laughs> <laughs> the religious junk, man made religious ideas of God 
His power. What causes His power to work or not to work? What we thought would make demand on God's power instead of what the Word said made demand on His power has caused us to fall in great disasters and defeats and create religious man-made doctrines and ideas that have put generation after generation under bondage and left them sick to die at young ages. And in many cases left them to go to hell and suffer the consequences of hell itself because of men's ridiculous ideas of what it took to be saved. Instead of what the Bible said calls on that power that causes a man to be born again. Now, in closing, let me tell you this. Power was demanded. The Bible said Jesus saw their faith. By exercising faith, they made demand on the power of God. And they made demand on that power. The Bible said Jesus saw their faith and said. He saw and said. He saw their faith and he said something. His word has been sent to heal you. He saw their faith and said something. He saw their faith and said. The moment he saw their faith, he said something. God said something. Hallelujah. The moment that faith came on the scene. Do you remember when Daniel prayed before God for 21 days? Thank God Daniel was smart enough to keep his mouth shut, but it's obvious what was in his thinking because of what the angel said to him when he appeared to him. He said, fear not, Daniel. Fear not. Fear not. For I am sent from God because of your words and from the first day you decided to understand God sent me. Now, Daniel had begun to think, I wonder if God heard me. I wonder if God heard what I... You know, he bounced. I mean, 21 days, man, he hadn't had nothing good to eat. 21 days, he's... But he's sitting there with better sense than to open his mouth and just stayed put and just stayed, stayed right where he was. God moved from the first day. Oh, brother, what in the world's the matter here? The devil was the matter. That's what's the matter. Well, I prayed to God to get the devil off of me. That's the reason it didn't work. Huh? That's the reason it didn't work. I mean, I heard my mama pray that way. I heard the pastor pray that way. You ought to stop and analyze your prayers sometimes and find out why you're praying what you're praying. I was praying what I prayed because I heard my daddy pray it that way, and I found out one day he was wrong too. And so, all through the years, without going to the Word of God, and I'd find out what the Bible had to say about praying the wrong thing all the time. Dad always prayed, forgive us all of our sins. He put that on the end of every prayer. Forgive us all of our sins in the name of Jesus. Amen. And I asked him one day, I said, Daddy, did you sin? No, not to know of. Why? I said, what did you pray for that for then? Pray for what? I said, you prayed, forgive us our sin. He said, did I pray that? I said, Daddy, you mean tell me you didn't know when you prayed that? He said, no. I said, I've known you for 31 years and you prayed it every time I ever heard you pray. Oh, sure enough, did he? All this time he'd been praying that out of habit and didn't realize he prayed it. I said, there ain't no use in asking forgiveness of sin unless you sin. Get rid of that sin consciousness. He said, well, I won't. Now that you brought it to my attention, he said, I didn't know I was doing that. Praying a prayer like, God be with us today. God be with this poor mother. God be with this boy here. God be with this fellow here. Oh, if it be your will, heal him. Brother, what in the world's wrong with a prayer like that? Well, in the first place, God said, I'll be, I will never leave you nor forsake you even to the end of the earth. So you've got God's word for that. You wasted your time and called him a liar by insinuating he wasn't going to be there. You could have just said, I thank you that you're here and I'm praising you for it. And by your stripes, he's been healed and I'm going to lay my hands on him. And you said they'd recover. Thank you. That's all necessary. And then walk in the light of it in spite of all hell can do to prove otherwise than the word. Making demand. They, he saw their faith. Now I'm going to give you a couple of things here that will make demand on the Word and on the power of God. 
He saw their... Fa- Look at Galatians 3, 5. You've got to read this. I, I must show you this because I'm going to say something here that I do not want to be misunderstood concerning. And I want you to understand, I'm saying it to you in love, but it's something that God's been dealing with me on now for two, three weeks, and I, and I can no longer be quiet about it because I'm obligated to speak to you the things from the Word of God. Galatians 3, 5, He therefore that ministereth to you the Spirit and worketh miracles among you, doeth he it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? The hearing of faith. If you are going to make demand on the power of God, the Bible said he saw their faith. He saw their faith. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. The miracles that are done among us are done by the hearing of faith. If you are going to make demand on the Word of God, I say this in all sincerity. I say it realizing the background a lot of you have where your churches are concerned. But nevertheless, I am going to say it. If you are going to receive God's healing power, you're going to have to get out from under that unbelief. God told that man to get up and get out of here. Get out of here. I don't care... What name you have on your church, I do care what's preached there. And some of the worst junk in the world is preached in so-called full gospel churches. And their pastors and pastors' wives and Sunday school superintendents are dying with sickness and disease right in the middle of a house full of Holy Ghost power-filled people. It is not the will of God, and don't you ever let anybody slap that injustice saying at God's doorstep. I'll not tolerate it around me. Don't you come to me and tell me it wasn't God's will to heal some man when he's got a wife and two little babies in his household. That man die young and tell me that's God's will. How dare you, sir? How dare you? How dare you? You can't do it in the face of Calvary. We've got that old bloody mountain to deal with, brother, whether you like it or whether you don't. What was wrong? Was it cause a man's sin? Probably not. What was wrong? Because he's quit digging in the Word of God like men of old dug in, in the physical laws to learn what made electricity work and learn what made penicillin and learn what makes airplanes fly and wouldn't receive some religious man's foolhardiness when he said it wasn't God's will to fly and just kept jumping off of the barn and just kept jumping off of the barn and jumped off and jumped off until one day, bless God, he flew. And we have the Spirit of God and the Word of God. And don't tell me you don't have time because eternity is a long while. The reason that the pastors and their wives are dying with cancer and dying under the pressure of debt is because they're spending all their time on what the seminary taught instead of what Jesus had taught. And digging into that word. When a man finally comes to the place where he can walk into his wife's sick room and sit, looks her right in the face and says, Sweetheart, I love you and all that. But this sickness don't mean a thing in this world. God's word says by his stripes we're healed and you're healed whether you know it or whether you don't. And I'm going to preach it if you lay right here and die. And when men come to that place, you know what you're going to do? You're going to get mama out of the bed. It's no strange thing, no strange thing that people that are firm on God's Word are the ones that gather up the persecution and the rebuke. There ain't anybody, re- there ain't nobody persecuting some milky, toast, mealy mouth, little worrywart. 
<laughs> Jimmy Swaggart said to me one time, he ministered to me one time. I mean, got me delivered right out of the jaws of hell, bless his heart. And he said to me one time, he said, Can I? Some fella out here that's been pastoring a church for 45 years and got six in Sunday school is never going to go down big. He said, if he fails, it'll be over not being able to pay the bills on a place or something. said, he's never going to make the front page of the paper because he got caught in a hotel room with some other fella's wife. said, if he did, nobody would say anything about it. He said, the choice demons of hell are set aside for those that are up on the front line, man, the ones up on the head of that spear. He said, the fellow that's preaching to thousands, he said, that's the one Satan's going to try to haul down big. That's the one he's just sending the, the choice devils of hell are reserved for him. That's the reason people in my position, in his position, in your position, if you're doing what God told you to do, it wasn't the fact that the guy's only ministering to six that caused it, it's the fact that he just sat out there and wouldn't do anything. You know, I mean, never cause any ripples. Oh, let's don't make the water wave. Don't, don't rock the boat. Don't rock the boat. I had a fellow tell me one time I was going to go preach in his church. I'd been in one meeting over there several weeks before, and he'd already invited me for another one. And he called me the day before the meeting started and said, Brother Copeland, don't preach nothing very deep this week. I said, huh? <laughs> he said, don't preach anything very deep this week. I said, why? He said, I just now have the congregation settle down. After the other meeting. <laughs> well, now, you know what that did for me? That's just like going out in front of a bull and say, with a big red rag, and say, sit! <laughs> ain't no way, baby. <laughs> that just ain't going to happen. He's not going to sit, and you waving that rag in front of him. Uh-uh. What he was actually saying to my ears was, now, Kenneth, I've got this bunch where I can play golf three days a week now. Now let them alone, because I don't want it to ever grow any bigger than this. He told me that out of his own mouth. I'm judging him out of the words of his own mouth. That's what the Lord said to me. I'm not judging. That's what the Lord said to me. He said, I'll judge him by the words of his own mouth. He said, I don't want this church to get any bigger. I can handle it just like it is. And that was his problem. He was handling it. God can handle one with a million people in it. You can't handle one with two. They'll vote you out. It's two to one. <laughs> All right. This is, this is a very serious thing. It's time. To lay everything else aside. All of our thinking and all of the stuff. And get back in this old book. My God, folks, this is where the answers are. And study it. And dig in it, brother. When you go to digging in this, it's better than digging in a gold mine. Because it's in here. The answers to the silver and the gold and the oil is all in here. Well, now, brother, now, I wouldn't say that. Well, that's the reason you're having a hard time buying gas. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, I'll show you how to suck the oil out of the flinty rock. And we've got enough shale oil to operate this country for a thousand years. And this doesn't anybody know how to get it out. And if some believer would take that scripture and stand on it, and stand on it, and stand on it, and stand on it, and forget about what Shell and Texaco say about it. Forget about trusting the man that wears the star. My Lord God, trust the man that was born under the star. Praise God. And God will show you how to suck that all out of that flinty rock. And give you $9,256 billion to put into the gospel. 
belongs to you anyway. Amen. Amen. This is where we are right now. God's power is here right now to heal if we'll make demand on it. When the Spirit of God came into His ministry, folks, I mean the very air that we breathe is permeated with enough power to heal everybody in China all at once. I mean, every little, every little molecule of air has got enough of the power of God in it to heal everybody at one time. My God, people, how much of God does it take? And you can take scrapings out of his little, up under his little fingernail and explode the universe with it. He's God. This person is God that we're talking about. And he's made himself available to the likes of you and me. Now, all we need to learn how to do is make demand on His power. How? Get under the Word. Get under the Word. I don't care if you are going to keep your membership over there in that, that church you've been going to. That's all right. I'm not, you do what God wants you to do about that. But if they're not preaching the Word of God, you're going to have to get some Word some other way. And if you have something wrong in your body, I'm going to tell you right now, you're going to have to stay out from under that trash over there until you get some Word in you and get rid of that. Now take Jesus' lead and get up and get out of there. Get out from under that unbelief. Get out from under that if it be thy will, trash. Get out from under that it's passed away. Silliness. Passed away. Dear God, who ever heard of God passing away? Did God ever healed one human being on earth? And thank God I'm expecting Him to heal me. Not because of me, but because of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. The second thing is this. Begin to act on the Word as though Jesus Himself spoke it to you personally in the flesh. Begin to act on it. Begin to think that way. Begin to think. I made the commentary, saith the Lord, on Isaiah chapter 6. I gave forth that commentary in the 13th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, and I've never changed, and I am the same today. And if you will follow my commentary on Isaiah 6, you will receive. That's what the Spirit of God just said. Well, we better turn over there and see what he said. Matthew 13, verse 15. Well, now, wait a minute. That's the commentary. Let's read Isaiah 6. Praise God, yeah. Verse 9, He said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Now let's get Jesus' commentary on it in the 13th chapter of Matthew. This people's heart is waxed gross, 15th verse. Their ears are dull of hearing, their eyes they have closed, lest at any time... Well, right now is any time, isn't it? Any time they should see with their eyes. See what? Well, he's talking about the Word. Hear the Word with their ears, and should understand with their heart and should be converted, and I should heal them. Anytime you will see the Word with your eyes, hear the Word with your ears, understand it in your heart, and allow the Word to convert the way you think, the way you speak, and the way you act, you will receive healing. Now, there's no failure in God's Word. You, he said, I will heal them. Well, I didn't get my healing. Well, then go back there and run that list and see what you did wrong. You either hadn't been looking at it with your eyes or hearing it with your ears or both. 
Well, I thought I had. No, you didn't. Now, just get honest about it. You're not sure not going to get anywhere lying to yourself. Get honest about it. Well, brother, I've been reading the Word. I want to ask you something. How long, how many hours a day will a cancer work against your body? I mean, does it work five minutes of the morning before breakfast? Does it work 15 minutes right before bed? Uh, 24 hours a day. 24 hours versus 15 minutes. There's no way in the world that that's going to iron out. You're not seeing the Word with your eyes. You're playing with it. Oh, but brother, I prayed. What did you pray? I prayed, God, heal me. I want to ask you something. Okay. How would he go about doing that? Huh? How? You said, God, heal me. How would he go about healing you? Well, he sent his word and it healed. That's right. What word are you standing on? Huh? What word has he sent to heal you? Well, I don't know what you mean about that. He sent His Word to heal you, and you don't have any of it to stand on. There's not any of it to heal you. That's like the guy said, I sent that jar of salve over there to get rid of that rash on the back of your hand. What did you do with it? I, I mean, I'm, you know, it's sitting right there by my bed. What did you do with it? I stuck it in my nose. <laughs> What was wrong with your nose? Nothing. The rash is on my hand. Why didn't you put it on your hand? It just looked like it ought to have been in my nose to me. <laughs> they said, man, that's stupid. That isn't any more stupid than saying he sent his word and heals you and you're not applying any of the word to the cancer. You're not applying. You're not applying it. How's it going to do you any good? Oh, I mean, brother, it lays there right by my bed and I kiss it twice a day. That, that ain't going to do anything. You can kiss that jar, that salve come in, it won't do nothing. You can eat it, lick it, put it on the bumps, on the hand, because that's where the salve was made to go, and that's where it's made to work. You're going to have to apply the Word to your heart to your mind and to the cancer. You're going to have to go talk in Scripture to that cancer. You're going to have to go to talking to it and you have to go to speaking to it like what it is. It's a killer and it's invaded the temple of God and you're going to have to take the rope and the sword of God's power and drive it out of that temple just like Jesus drove those other guys out of the temple of God in Jerusalem. Drive it out of there with it. I'm going to tell you right now, don't come up here and tell me you haven't got time to spend all day in the Word of God when you've got some kind of sickness and disease in your body. You're going to have time in a few days. You're going to be so far behind, man, that you're going to have a hard time catching up with that thing. You're letting the disease get ahead of you. You ought to be doing this before you ever get sick. That's when you walk in it, and when that symptom shows up, just slam it right in the face. You get to where the devil had rather go anywhere in the world than your house. He don't want to.